All right, we are ready to get started. As far as those who are on our sick list, Janine's doing better. She's at home. Uh, she's still kind of weak and uh, has a little bit of trouble talking. So remember her in your prayers, if you will. Uh, we had uh, a lot of our knee surgeries. Uh, Christy Sells was here today. Christy Sells. Why not call her? Yeah, that's right. I never even knew her before she was married. I don't know why. Okay. But anyway, yeah, she was here today, so I was glad to see that. Uh, who else we need to bring up? My daddy goes back to Nashville Wednesday. He has cardiovascular cancer. Okay. Now, the first one didn't work, and so they gave him, what, three weeks? Three weeks. And then they're going to try it again. Okay. Kevin Farley, I think it was Monday, had his port pulled out accidentally by a nurse. And so uh, he had to go back to Louisville yesterday to get it put back in. So, and so he was kind of bummed about that. So he claims he has reached his deductible. I don't know. As often as he's gone. All right. Noreen's here with us. We're glad that you're here. She had some oral surgery. And so we're glad that you're back with us. I see... Um, Trying to think, is there anybody I've left off? Ann York has been here. She was here today. That's right. Right back there. Oh, she was back there. I'm sure she's back there now, but it was good to see her as well. All right. <coughs> Let's go ahead and start with our class. We're doing our survey going through our Gospels, and today we're going to be in the book of John. All right. Now, John is different than your other three Gospels, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are called the synoptic gospels. And that's a fancy word. Synoptic is from the same Latin word that we get synonym from. In other words, if you read the book of Mark, you're going to find about 90% of it also in Matthew and about 90% of it also in Luke. The three are very similar and the three were written pretty close to the same time. And so there's a lot of... A lot of, uh, I wouldn't say copying, but a lot of similar material. Now, the book of John came out about 25 years later than the other three Gospels. And it covers a lot of different stuff. We'll see a lot of different miracles and a lot of different teachings in John that we don't see in the others. Now, that doesn't mean that it's not inspired, but it means John's writing from a different perspective. And he's writing with a different aim, if you will. Um, John is writing from the Isle of Patmos, most likely, or the city of Ephesus. He's been an apostle for a good while. And so much of John is uh, reflected, the Gospel of John, if you look at it, can be reflected into a lot of the false teaching that's going on as you go through the area. And so what you're going to see with John, the Gospel of John, is a great, strong focus on Jesus being the Son of God, on Him being from heaven and him being holy. Roger, I'm glad you're here. How's your wife? She's, uh, they didn't find any heart trouble. Good. Just, uh, they didn't say it, but they thought it was just uh, anxiety. Okay. She was afraid of uh, having more surgery. Good. You well, know, I bet. You know, she's been struggling with her foot, and uh, she had some chest pains and some shortness of breath Wednesday. <coughs> so she'd gone into the hospital over in Mayfield. All right. Well, good. Glad you're here. When's the shoulder surgery? Uh, all right, not yet. Okay. All right. Well, if you wait for your wife to get fixed, well, we're not going to go there. But anyway. All right. So we're looking at John. John is from a very heavenly perspective. We're going to really push. And so you'll see throughout the Gospels a lot of Jesus and his relationship with God, a lot of how he came from heaven, and a lot of how he's on a spiritual plane. Now, a lot of people today... Say that 1 John is written to her in the response to the Gospel of John because 1 John focuses on Jesus as being a man. Remember 1 John beginning of verse 1? That which we have seen, that which we have held, that which we have touched, that which we have beheld with our own eyes, that is the Son of God. And so 1 John is really focusing on, yes, Jesus was a real person, but the Gospel of John is focusing on Jesus being the Son of God and his communication with us. <coughs> uh, quick illustration. Starting at the very beginning of the book, right? 
In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He is in the beginning with God. God is with him. With him, without, uh, through him, everything was made. Without him, nothing was made that was made. He came to this earth, and he was the light of life of men. Okay? You go through those first few verses. What's John trying to get across? He didn't cover the birth of Jesus. He goes to the very beginning, doesn't he? In the beginning was the Word. Now, why would you call Jesus the Word, the Logos? Why would you call him the Word? What's the purpose of words? Communication. Communication. Not to put you to sleep, right? Not in church. Communication. That is how something that percolates in here, and I want it to percolate in your head, the way to get it from here to there is through communication, through words. And so right now, I'm thinking about pink elephants, okay? That popped in my head right here, and I said pink elephants, and guess what just popped in your head? Okay? There's no telling what popped in your head. But anyway, hopefully something close to pink elephants. It's a way of communicating. Now, why would Jesus be called the Word? What is the purpose of him coming to this earth? Communicate God. Communicate God. Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father, right? <clears throat> you have seen God. And so you see a lot of that coming through in this gospel. Okay, so it's written much later. Many people think that John was probably young as the apostles, one of the younger ones. You look at Da Vinci's Last Supper, if you remember that picture. Remember, that's where they're all sitting on one side of the table and they're all hanging out. You'll see a young fellow with real long hair. He looks like a baby almost, like a young teenager. Everybody else has beards. He doesn't have a beard, and he's leaning on Jesus. That's Da Vinci's interpretation of John being a very young man. Because John lived almost the next century. We know that he lived at least until 93 or 94 A.D. So he lived, what, 60, 65 years after the crucifixion. He was around a long time. So a lot of people think John was a very young man when he wrote the book. All right. Um, I'm looking at the book. Go ahead and pull out some of this stuff. Focuses on his divinity and power, written later. Covers a little bit of different subject material. (coughs) Favorite words. John really loves words. Okay? Uh, The word truth. Okay? The law came through Moses, 114, but grace and truth through Jesus Christ. Right? Uh, John, let's see, 832. You shall know the truth. The truth shall set you free. John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. John 17, 17. Thy word is truth. Sanctify them by truth. John 18, 32. As Jesus is talking to Pilate, Pilate looks at him, kind of giggles, and says, what is truth? See the irony that's there? That's just a quick review. Truth is found 32 times in the Gospel of John. I just quoted probably eight. But you see what John does, you go through his book, and he hits a word over and over and over. And that word will resonate as it comes along. The same thing is happening with life. Now, the issue with life for us, if you are, uh, you know, a regular person just reading your Bible, there's two different words for life which will go through John. And so sometimes it's kind of difficult as you go through and you look at that. Okay, life, uh, the word love is there. Uh, The word light. What are some examples in John where you see light? You think of any? <coughs> Look there in chapter 1. Okay. This man, conquered by John the baptizer, came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. He was not that light, to bear witness of the light, that light which came to all men. Okay. And that light is Christ. Jesus also at the Feast of Tabernacles, when everybody lights their candles, what did he say? I am the... Light of the world, right? Okay, he talks about the sins of darkness and people wanting to be in darkness and things such as that. So one thing you'll notice about John when you go through, John is a fascinating character because you'll go through and it is the easiest book to translate. If you took a Greek class at Fried Hardman or Harding or Lipscomb or any place like that, 
the first year, you learn your words, you learn your declensions. In other words, you know, past tense, present tense, that sort of thing. The second year, you start translating a book. The first book you will translate is 1 John. The next book you will translate is the Gospel of John. Because John uses very simple, short words, and he uses the same word over and over. So if you just learn a few words, you can translate the book of John. But John's also one of the deepest books. Because what John does, you can see just how educated he is because the way in which he writes and he's hitting the same thing, teaching the same lesson over and over. Notice how John loves the number seven, right? We've got the seven I am statements, you got the seven miracles, and you had the seven witnesses. And you run across these witnesses, you run across these miracles, <coughs> you run across these I am statements. What John is doing is even though it's very simple, he is over and over proving the divinity or the sonship of Jesus as the son of God. And so it's really fascinating the way that he works that through and pulls that across. All right. Now going through the book of John, what's your favorite part? What are some parts that stand out to you that you like about the gospel? You think? Oh, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. Okay, very good. And you see something else in uh, the book of John, something which I'd forgotten. John sometimes is a runner on her. Uh, you ever notice how some people, you get them on a story, and then they start talking, and then they start talking about something else, and you don't know where they stopped because they just keep going and going and going? That never happens in the sermons, right? Okay, but it might happen in the sermons sometimes. John likes to do that. You get in John, he meets a man named Nicodemus. Nicodemus comes to him in John chapter 3, verse 2, says, Lord, you know, we know that you must be from God, for nobody can do these things unless God is with him. Jesus starts with him talking about, unless you're born again of water and spirit, you should never see the kingdom of God. <coughs> Nicodemus comes back and says, well, you know, hey, I'm a big guy. I'm not going to fit in my mother's womb. So I don't know what in the world you're talking about. And Jesus says, I'm talking about spiritual things and not physical things. And if you can't understand the spiritual, how can I ever talk to you about the other things? Well, we understand there until about verse 11 or 12, it's a conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. But Jesus keeps going. Was he still talking to Nicodemus at chapter 3 and verse 16? Was he still talking to Nicodemus at 323? We don't know where Nicodemus that stops because John is still going on and teaching back from everything which is there. So it's pretty interesting as we run across and look at that. So that's another good thing to know about it. All right. Now you remember because we just covered the book of John here just a few weeks ago. John is split into two parts, Right? Chapters 1 through 12 talk about the Son of God. Chapters 13 through 21 talk about the Son of Man. Uh, another way to put it, chapters 1 through 12, Jesus' earthly ministry. 13 through 21, Jesus' heavenly ministry. In other words, what we see is chapters 1 through 12 are the three and a half years of his ministry. Starting in chapter 13, actually you're only covering about the next, last three weeks. Of course, you have the 50 days after the resurrection. But even though 13 to 21 is half the book, it actually only happens in a very short time. It's Jesus going to Jerusalem, being crucified, <coughs> rising from the grave, and then speaking to his apostles afterwards. So it's interesting seeing how that book splits like that, how he does that. That's a good outline there. All right, let's look at some of these sevens, all right? Jesus says, I am the bread of life. In what way is Jesus the bread of life? He feeds our soul, right. Um, as we continue after that, remember Jesus has just fed the thousands, right? And they decide to follow after Jesus. They decide to make him a king. And so they start following him around. And Jesus turns around to the crowd. <coughs> he says something very interesting. He says, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you can have no part of me. And the people thought, man, we ain't doing that. And so they turned around and left him. 
And so Jesus in 664 and 65, we see that everybody is leaving him. Chapter 6 and verse 66, 666 of John there. It's just coincidence, but I always like it. John 6 and verse 66, saddest verse of the Bible. All the people up and left him. And so Jesus looks to his apostles and he says, Are you also going to leave me? <coughs> and they say to him in chapter 6 and verse 68, Lord, to whom else shall we go? For you have the words of life. In other words, we have to follow after you. You are the light of the world. Now, some people will take that early part in chapter 6 where Jesus says, Unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you have no part of me. Something interesting, sometimes we forget here, that's not talking about the Lord's Supper. It sounds very similar to the Lord's Supper because the uh, fruit of the vine represents his blood. The bread represents his flesh. What Jesus is talking about there is you have to participate in the life of Jesus. You have to participate and follow him as his disciples. What Jesus is telling the people is... Don't follow me just for the potluck. Follow me for the life transformation. The people, when they were following, if they had been told they had to take the Lord's Supper, they'd probably been said, okay, we'll take the Lord's Supper. But they recognize that life transformation which is there. You watch us on Sunday night sometimes. When we have a potluck, our attendance goes up about 15 people. Free food is good stuff, Right? But that's not the only reason you should come to church. It's not the only reason you should be a Christian is because of all of our ladies and their great casserole dishes. The reason you ought to be a Christian is because you want to participate in the life of Jesus and follow him along. Okay? Feast of Tabernacles, we talked about that earlier. On that last day of the feast, everybody lights their lamps. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. In what way is he light to us? He shows us the way. Today, night's not a big deal for us, right? You hop in your car, you turn on the headlights, you can see as well at night as you can day as you're going up and down the streets. Uh, if I preach too long tonight, they can just flip on those lights and uh, we can see in here just fine, right? But back in the day, when the sun went down, you had to burn oil in a lamp. Now, those folks around here who remember back the kerosene lamps... I don't think anybody remembers back to the whale oil. But if you remember the kerosene lamps, you remember it would light things up, but it smelt bad, and it didn't light it up as well as the day does, did it? You know, you could just kind of see shadows, really. Uh, some people really were able to light those suckers good, and so, yeah, you could see pretty well, but it's inconvenient. Jesus, as he's speaking, is talking about that light <coughs> like we have that illuminates everything. Why do you need light at night? There's obstacles that get in your way and cause you to fall down. There's scary stuff out there. You're afraid that you know, you're not alone maybe, especially if you're a kid. And you just don't know what's around you. Jesus answers every one of those issues. He shows us the obstacles and the dangers of life, what we need to avoid, what we need to go to. He shows us that we're not alone because he's always with us. And he shows us his strength over anything that would hurt us. All right, then we get into our uh, sheep analogy. He's the door of the sheep. Now, why is this a big deal? How do you get into the sheepfold? You got to go through the door. And the point he's making here is the way to get in is through him. Now, you can tell this is written back in the 90s, a little bit later after the fall of Jerusalem. Because a lot of Jews believe that they were in the sheepfold because of why? Their father was who? Abraham. Abraham is our father. In fact, you'll see it in that very same chapter. <coughs> Excuse me, chapter earlier. Abraham is our father. And Jesus says, I can make children of Abraham out of these stones. Stones may be another way of talking about Gentiles. Okay? The only way into the sheep gate is not by your family. It is through Jesus Christ. Now, you'll have some boogers who try to jump the fence, and they may say they're part of the sheepfold, and they may act like sheep, but they're imposters. Because unless you come through the door, you can't be a sheep. Unless you come through Christ, you can't be a Christian. All right, going a little further. 
The good shepherd, all right? Why is it important to have a good shepherd? You don't want a bad shepherd because they're bad. Huh? Okay, there's false shepherds. Selfish ones. Ones who want to sit around and play on their cell phone instead of watching the sheep. I don't know if they did that back then. Ones who are selfish and take all the uh, reward and the pay and the benefits. But as soon as a lion, as soon as a wolf come, they run away. All right? Yes, ma'am, Marilyn. Oh, that's a fun one. Let's look there, John 10, 16. Because that's a good one, because a lot of people like to use that. All right, let's start a little bit earlier. Verse 11, okay? I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep, but a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees a wolf coming, leaves, <coughs> leaves the sheep and flees. The wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he's a hireling, doesn't care about the sheep. I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and I'm known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I'll lay down my life for the sheep. And now verse 16. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. They will hear my voice. They will be one flock and one shepherd. He goes on, the Father loves me because I lay down my life for the sheep. Now, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints loves that verse. Because here's what they're teaching is. Jesus died, right? Was buried, was raised. Went up into heaven. And then he went over to the Americas. Came down, taught the gospel over into the Americas. Okay? And taught a latter revelation which is there. And one of the passages which they go to to prove that that happened is this passage. And they say there was other sheep. And they say if there's other sheep, where could they have been? Well, they're over in the Americas. And that's what we're talking about. All right? The Greek word for that teaching is bullarchy. All right? Okay? What's he talking about here? Who are these people thinking? Jews are the children of God, and what's Jesus saying? There's others whom they don't think would ever fit in to God's people, and God loves them, and there's going to be one, one flock and one shepherd. As we would read in Galatians 3.28, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. There's neither male nor, there's neither slave nor free. But we are all one in Jesus Christ. Okay? So there's some other sheep that you don't expect that would listen to the gospel. But Jesus will save those as well. All right? Any questions? Thoughts on that? Does that seem to fit? What do you think, Marilyn? Yeah. Okay, so you thought the sheep were in his flock. Right. I think he's saying they are the same. They are the same. Saved. Yeah, the only way you can be saved, John 14, 6, is through Jesus Christ. And so all these sheep are going to have to come through Jesus Christ. All these sheep are going to have to come through the door. But when you're here in John, is it 10? When you're here in John 10, Jesus says there are some other sheep which y'all don't know about yet. I would say Gentiles. I would say he's speaking about bringing the Gentiles in. That's what I would think. Now, you run into, you run into um, John talking about the present here. Uh, let me explain what I mean, okay? Because it's not always present in their day. John sometimes is looking to the future. And to illustrate what I mean, let's go back to John 3, okay? Jesus tells Nicodemus, unless you're born of water and of the Spirit... You shall not see the kingdom of God. <clears throat> Did Nicodemus need to go that day and be baptized for the remission of his sins to be added to the Lord's church? 
Church hadn't been established yet, has it? But as John is looking back across into that age, he's writing Jesus' teachings and talking about how they apply (coughs) to the present day. Does that make sense? Okay. So in John 10, when he says, I have other sheep who are not of this fold, he's not talking about how these Gentiles are saved at that moment, but he's talking about in his present tense, in his present time, both Jews and Gentiles will comprise the Lord's church. Sometimes that's kind of confusing. And if it is confusing to you, just totally forget I said that. Right. The gospel could not be preached. They were not baptized for the remission of sins until after his death. Now, you'll have some people who quibble with it. And they'll say, okay, well, the apostles were baptized by John's baptism and others were as well. And we can quibble and go back and forth. And that's okay. That's okay. Because I've been wrong about a lot of things. So that's all right. But I have fun talking through it. Okay. So does that make sense? The idea of I have shepherd or he is the good shepherd. And notice what he says here. The sheep know me by name. They say, of course, I've never been over there. But like you go to a watering hole and all the sheep will come and they'll drink water from like four or five or six different shepherds. And they'll come and they'll mix in and they're just doing their thing. Shepherd will let them there for a while. And they claim that when the shepherd's ready to go, he'll just back up some whistle, some yell, some squawk or have whatever noise it is. That calls their sheep. And when the sheep hear their shepherd's voice or whistle or whatever it is, those sheep will come. And so as you're around a watering hole and you look at all these sheep, for us it would be hard to tell which ones were this guy's and which ones were that guy's and which ones belonged where. But the sheep know the voice of the shepherd and they follow him. Okay? There's application there. What's the application? I go to Walmart. I feel like I go to Walmart way too much. I go to Paducah and go to a movie or go somewhere else in Paducah. All right? Somebody sees me walking along. Okay? Do they recognize me as God's child or they recognize me as just looking like everybody else? Maybe if they knew me very well, maybe if they talked to me very well, that light and that salt would show. But really, I don't look a lot different than everybody else. At least I hope not. Right? Right? But the way to tell that I'm a Christian is when I hear the voice of God, I follow it. Now, how do you identify the true church today? It's not the biggest. It's not the most popular. It's not the one with the leading edge of entertainment. But it's the one who follows whom? They hear the voice of Christ. They hear the voice of God. And they follow it. And they go wherever he leads. Okay, you see the application there? And the application of how it works? To the world, we may not look a lot different. But Christ recognizes us because when he calls, and when he commands, we follow and we obey because he's the good shepherd. Okay? Also the good shepherd, he feeds his sheep, he protects his sheep, he guides his sheep to the green pastures, And he takes care of us in every way that's there. Any more comment on good shepherding? Can you apply that also to the local congregation, the shepherds? Okay. They must know their flock. If they don't know their flock and don't know the history of the flock, don't know the family history, they'll have difficulty in managing their flock. (coughs) Yes. What Bill has just said, talking about shepherds of the congregation. And that's a good um, word to use. Acts 20, 1 Peter 5. They're called shepherds. One of the good things about shepherds, if a shepherd is good, is he knows the flock. Lynn Anderson, a fellow who used to teach at ACU, wrote a book many years ago, and that book's entitled, They Smell Like Sheep. And what he uses, what he talks about in that book is about how a good shepherd gets around his sheep so much that when he walks into the marketplace, everybody's like, wow, he has been around sheep. You know, he's been around some livestock. And he said, that's a sign of a good shepherd because he's around his people enough that they've rubbed off on him. Now, our elders hopefully don't smell like everybody else. That's kind of a weird illustration there, isn't it? But they need to know what's going on in the lives of the people who are there. 
The qualification of elders covers not only doctrine, right? It covers also their family life. And it covers also their reputation. Whatever their reputation is in the community and in the church. And their history, right? They've been there a long time and people know them. And they know their family and they know their background. Okay? That's a good point as well. All right, anything else? All right. He's the resurrection and the life. His good buddy Lazarus is sitting there in the grave, and Martha is chewing him out. All right? And Mary comes and chews him out. Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. Right? Well, Jesus tells Martha, you're going to see your brother again. And she says, I know about the resurrection. I know about the life. And Jesus proves to, him, to her and everybody else his power. Lazarus, come forth. And out comes Lazarus from the grave, wrapped in his clothes, those grave clothes. Even the dead listen to him. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 15, as Jesus is near the Mount of Olives, they claim that that is the vine gate, that the gate there, the Bethsaida gate, had a lot of vines which were growing on it. And so Jesus talks about how he's the true vine. Now, some people apply this to denominations. It doesn't work that way. It's individuals. Okay? We have to produce fruit as individuals. Then we'll be pruned. If we do not produce fruit, we'll be cut. How do you produce fruit? You're connected into the, the uh, trunk of Jesus Christ, into the root of Christ. And that fruit is the life which we have. All right? How many witnesses did you have to have under the law of Moses? At least two. Jesus goes through, John the baptizer, sees Jesus and recognizes him as the Son of God. Nathaniel, after he hears that Jesus saw him under the fig tree and knew where he was when his brother came to get him, <coughs> excuse me, he admits that he must be the Son of God. Peter it says to him, the passage we just looked at, to whom else shall we go? You are the ones with the word of life. Martha at the grave of Lazarus says, we know that you are the Messiah. Thomas, doubting Thomas. See what happens when you miss church on Sunday night. Jesus showed up. The other 11 were there and got to see him. Thomas skipped church Sunday night. Probably something good on TV. Thomas missed church and didn't get a chance to see Jesus. So eight days later, here comes Thomas. Here comes Jesus. And Jesus tells him what? Place your fingers in the holes, your hand in the side, and believe. Thomas sees it, falls to his knees, and says, My Lord and my God. Confession there, Jesus says, the Messiah. John 20 and 31, talking about that these things you may believe in knowing that Jesus is the Son of God. You see the seven witnesses who are there. And of course, the seven miracles, which have been defined or categorized in different ways. Miracle over the physical, miracle over the hunger, a miracle over the wrong, miracle over the sea. As you go through, you see each one of those miracles that are there. All right, let's look at some of our lessons here. I'm running out of time. The preacher talked too much. Little booger. Number one, the Word, that is Jesus, has always existed. There's not a beginning. There's not an end to Him. He is God. Well, if Jesus has always existed, why do we call Him the firstborn? Or the Son of God. You ever think about that? He's the first in the new order. First in the new order, okay. It's talking about his placement, okay? Talking about his power and authority in the kingdom. Okay? Number two, you must be born of water and of spirit to see the kingdom of God. Now, there's some denominational dudes who will speak of this water, okay? And they say that refers to natural birth. Okay? That's what he's referring there to. All right? What do you say in response to that? If a child's aborted, can he go to heaven? Absolutely. Okay? Jesus knew us in the womb. We have identity. Of course we'd go to heaven. All right? That's not what this is talking about here. And besides, especially during that day, as water birth became a little bit more prevalent many centuries later, not a lot of water present when a person is born. 
Okay, it's not talking about the water breaking. That's not what it's talking about at all. What Jesus is talking about here are the two elements that come together when a person obeys the gospel. Romans 6, 3 and 4, just as Christ died, was buried, and was raised to walk again, so also you and I died to our sins, we're buried in the waters of baptism, we're raised to walk in newness of life, Romans 6, 4. When that happens, it's not just water, but the Spirit is at work adding us to the Lord's kingdom. And so Jesus says you're born of water and of the Spirit. Those two are working together. All right? All right. Well, thank you for being here. Be sure to be back tonight at 6, right? 6 o'clock tonight will be our service.